As Calcutta approached its tercentenary year, Bikash Bhattacharya, the celebrated painter, was busy working on a difficult but challenging assignment. One of the city's leading newspapers had commissioned him to recreate Job Charnock's landing on the banks of the river Hooghly 300 years back in 1690. It is Charnock, the Englishman, who most historians give credit for founding Calcutta. No visual record of Charnock's voyage exists, but Bikash put together an arresting interpretation of the Englishman's first visit. The decision by this English trader to choose Sutanuti, a small village on the banks of the river Hooghly, was made after he had rejected a number of other sites. 24th August, 1690, the day Charnock arrived, was grey and overcast and Sudhanuti welcomed him with a spate of showers. No city in the world can ever be attributed to the genius of a single individual. Yet the seeds of metropolitan Calcutta are found in Charnock's selection of the Sudhanuti village as a trading post for the British and the impetus this decision provided. Over the last 100,000 odd days, the city has grown from the modest villages, coalesced and expanded into a sprawling metropolis. Today it has over 10 million people inhabiting both sides of the river Hooghly, cosmopolitan and diffused, aggravating and stimulating. Calcutta remains a fascinating megapolis. The unique spirit of humanism combined with a will to survive within the constraints of adversity. The sprawling Maidan area in the heart of Calcutta resonates to the call of commerce. These modern-day troubadours are also enterprising salesmen, singing their way to the heart of the customers. Three hundred years after Charnock's election, Calcutta echoes to the many sounds of commerce. Outside the stock exchange, 
the babble of stockbrokers waiting for the trading hours reinforces Calcutta's commercial character. The city's growth, in more ways than one, has been inextricably linked to its importance as a trading center. Charnock's choice of Sukhanuti was in the first place dictated by pure business consideration. He obviously saw in his landing site the advantages of a secure port, and this decision has stood the test of time. During the next 200 years, Calcutta was the epicenter of the British East India Company. The jute mills that sprouted on its shores, along with the British mercantile and trading houses, testified to its growing commercial importance. Ironically, Charnock did not live long to see his dreams fructify. He died two years after reaching Suthanuti in 1692. Today, a simple mausoleum and a modest epitaph in the heart of Calcutta, within the precincts of a church, records the Englishman's presence in the city he helped create. Calcutta's British legacy has shaped its political history and at least superficially helped carve the cultural contour of the city. For more than 200 years as the seat of the Raj, Calcutta enjoyed attention and prominence. It became the political capital and was the sparkling jewel in the British crown. The Victoria Memorial stands as a symbol and repository of two centuries of this British presence. It was after the death of Queen Victoria that Lord Curzon, the then British Viceroy, built this museum to commemorate the Raj in India, but mainly to pay tribute to what he thought was its most glorious phase, the reign of Queen Victoria, the imperious monarch who declared herself Empress of India in 1877. The memorial presides over the heart of Calcutta, impressive and dignified. And within the portals of its marble architecture are contained the symbols, paintings and mementos weaving the narrative of British India. In North Calcutta, in Beedon Street, is Debbari. Today the house is forlorn and lonely, but once it was part of that opulence which earned Calcutta the title City.
these consolidated and formalized their empire and were able to spread their business roots in the city, at least in part, because of active collaboration by a section of India. These Munchies, Banyas, Sarkars, and salt agents helped the British to carry on their trading and commercial activities. The Bajis, as these gentlemen were called, in the process were able to amass huge personal fortunes. The British patronage was responsible for making them a proud and popular in their society. The Bajis formed a culture which celebrated excellence and some came even better. Their extravagant homes were cast in marble and concrete. The huge mansions built under obvious European architectural influence were crowded with antiques, curios, and commentators. The By the end of the 19th century, Calcutta was ready to ornament itself with some symbols of modernization. It was around this time that Tram, an endearing hallmark of the city, crisscrossing its terrain, was established. The first experimental tram, drawn by horses, ventured along on 24 February 1873. Electric traction trams made their debut around a quarter century later in 1902. For almost eight decades, the tram has remained a quaint and charming mode of transport. The heritage of impressive buildings and facades began emerging with elegance and authority in the 18th and 19th centuries. The writer's buildings, which houses the state government even to this day, were built two centuries back. Interestingly, they were constructed as a set of apartments for the East India Company's young civilians called writers, from which it derives its name. Most of Calcutta's busiest thoroughfares, which pulsate with life and sounds today, were once nothing more than jungles and marshes. Chorangi was a hamlet of isolated hovels surrounded by waterlogged paddy fields and bamboo groves.
perhaps the most visible symbol of modernization in the Calcutta skyline is the Howrah Bridge. This 26,000 ton web of steel flung across the Hooghly is strung together with 3.5 million rivets. It is the third largest cantilever bridge in the world and is so huge a single facelift requires 24,000 liters of aluminium paint. And it is Calcutta's symbol of arrivals and departures. But it is beneath the Howrah Bridge that Calcutta presents a subculture. The Ganga, called the Hooghly in this stretch, has always enjoyed veneration, and the religious significance gives it a sanctity. Pilgrims and early morning bathers flock the ghats, and the odd juxtaposing of simple religious rituals with indigenous body massages is a common sight. Modern Calcutta indisputably exudes a cosmopolitan flavor, legitimizing its claim as one of the great cities of the world. But this cross-cultural matrix has been drawn by the presence of various ethnic communities, each with distinctively defined cultural identity. The Chinese celebrate their presence every new year with a traditional dragon dance, blazing forth a trail of color and pageantry. The Chinese came to Calcutta in search of business fortunes, but slowly integrated, becoming an important part of Calcutta's business community, prospering in shoemaking and leather industries. The Tangra and Benting Street areas of Calcutta are dominated by the Chinese. Their contemporary contribution are the martial arts classes where Chinese masters train their new karate kids. An ethnic presence older even than the Chinese is that of the Armenians. Their stock has reduced to near extinction in modern Calcutta, but once they monopolized Calcutta's thriving hotel trade. The Armenian school today is the last outpost of this community. Like the Armenians, 
The Anglo-Indians are also a dwindling lot. The Anglo-Indians are a product of a Eurasian culture, and their numbers are diminishing yearly through immigration to other countries. Many of the ethnic chips in Calcutta's cosmopolitan mosaic trace their ancestry to other regions within India. There is a substantial Muslim population, mostly immigrants from East Bengal and Bihar. They articulate a clear and strong social presence with an autonomous cultural existence. Every Sunday, these Bihari immigrants who have adopted Calcutta gather in the Maidan area to listen to religious discourses and share nostalgic memories of their homelands. Like expatriates anywhere in the world, they indulge in nostalgia even as they enrich the city they have chosen to make their new home. Like all great cities, Calcutta is not the preserve of a single community. Its cultural core, however, is provided by the Bengali tradition. The Bengali culture received a boost and modern transformation with the emergence of the Bengal Renaissance in the late 19th century. Western education, music, social and religious reform were initiated by pioneers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar and Vivekanand. The city realized its new identity and celebrated it with aplomb. This house, called the Jorashanko Thakurbari, is the ancestral home of the Tagores. It was here that the Nobel Prize winning poet Rabindranath Tagore spent his childhood, and here that he breathed his last. Today, the Jorashanko Thakurbari houses the Rabindra Bharati University, where students can obtain degrees in drama and the fine arts. <laughs> Rabindranath Tagore and his family, with their incredible literary and artistic contributions, have almost become synonymous with the best of Bengali culture. The cumulative influence of their genius, along with some of their contemporaries, have over the years helped shape Calcutta's, if not Bengal's, cultural psyche. <laughs> 